What is meditation? Uh, this one is very important. Breath theory emphasizes the importance of understanding what is meditation so that we understand what we are doing in the name of meditation. And this will keep us always in focus uh, so that we will not debate. If you don't understand what is meditation as taught by the Buddha, then you will debate. But when you understand what is meditation as taught by the Buddha, then you will know how to do it. So this is very important. Then the second understanding is there are two steps involved in the development of meditation as taught by the Buddha. Step one is to train the mind to be heedful. We are using a skillful means or an object of meditation to anchor the mind in awareness. The key word is in awareness or mindfulness, so that the mind is relaxed, aware, silent, and mindful within. So, heedfulness, as we all know, the Buddha already defined it under Dhammapada verse 23. There are two components to heedfulness. First component is constantly meditative. Second component is ever mindful. So to be ever mindful, we need to train our mind to be mindful first. So that is the first thing you have to do. Unless your spiritual faculty is already developed, then you no need to train. You no need object of meditation. You no need method. You no need technique. You no need skillful means. Well, once your spiritual faculty is developed, the mental hindrance cannot arise, which means you are already in the meditative state. You don't have to do anything. You will have sadha virya leading to sati and samadhi. And this sati and samadhi will allow you to meditate, to see things as they are. And it will maintain that mindfulness which is very stable. That's why initially, if you are still not uh, strong in developing the spiritual faculties, you need to train your mind to anchor it to something or to do the mind sweeping method or whatever skillful means to allow you to anchor the mind so that it does not wander off, get itself lost in thought, heedlessly lost in the thinking. Yeah. That's the reason why people need to use object of meditation, method and technique, or skillful means to do it. So what I have taught you is the mind sweeping method, which is also a skillful means. That one is uh, more easy to use and more effective. You just feel relaxed. You don't think. That's why you do the mind sweeping method from the forehead down. Relax body and mind. Just feel and relax. When you do that, you train your mind to be at the location you want it to be. Then you train your mind to feel, not to think. That's how it decondition the heedless thinking and develop the mind that listen to you. You want it to be at the forehead, you will be at the forehead. You want it to be at the heart, you will be at the heart. So mind sweeping method is a very good skillful means or technique to train your mind to be mindful, to be aware. Because when you just feel and relax, you cannot think. That's how you develop the silent mind. And as you do this more and more, more and more, it will help you to decondition the heedless thinking. That's the reason why the mind sweeping method is very useful uh, and helpful. Mm. But for those who are already used to whatever skillful means that you have, your method or technique or skillful means, you can straight away go into it. Then just anchor your mind there. Be mindful of your object of meditation or whatever technique, uh, anapanasati, or rising and falling, or the atonement, or the 
dynamic meditation the long body you know, the hand movement you just have to anchor your awareness or mindfulness to it uh, or Mahayana chanting or even the Thai tradition Puto, uh, or Sama or Rahang or whatever it's just a skillful way to anchor the mind to develop stability of mindfulness then after that stabilize it by allowing the mind to relax further so that this awareness or mindfulness become more and more refined until finally the mind becomes very quiet, very peaceful and very still. That is positive. Tranquility of mind or stillness of mind. And you stabilize that, the mind will enter sati. That's what you have to do. So stage one is just relax, maintain awareness. And if you need a method or technique to anchor, then do it. After you do it, like Anapanasati, don't continue anymore. You just relax and maintain the natural pace of Anapanasati, mindfulness of the in and out breath. Let it continue until the in and out breath becomes very quiet, very peaceful, very still, like there is no more breathing. So initially, you will reach the stage of quietness where there is very little movement of the breath. We call it the subtle breathing. The breathing has become very subtle and very still. That is a sign of transformation and progress. When your mind is about to enter sati, it becomes very quiet, very still. The sati is just there. No need to focus, no need to concentrate because the anapanasati has become very refined. Uh, you will experience piti, sukang, then pausati. Then mind enters it. Then by then, your mind is very sensitive. Wherever you locate this mind, it is very, very mindful, very sensitive. Then like the breath, initially like no more breathing, very subtle. Uh, but then if you continue to silence your mind, don't do anything, stay there, then your mind will enter sati. And when mind enters sati, you will be very surprised. The subtle breathing will come back to you, like become very clear again. Because when mind enters sati, your mindfulness has reached a more refined state that is extraordinarily sensitive. Then that time in the meditation, the slightest movement or activity is like magnified, like the whole movement is magnified. That's how your mind becomes different. Then it is always aware, hardly any thinking at all. Specific phenomenal awareness is very clear during that time. So that is the stage you have to reach. So after you reach that stage, then this mind that is already developed or trained can develop the daily mindfulness. Because after that, when you come out of the meditation, your mind has already entered sati. That everything you do is in sati. Your action, your movement, whatever seeing consciousness that you arise, everything is in sati. Whatever hearing is in sati, smell, taste, tactile, and thought process, they are all in sati. That's why your specific phenomenal awareness becomes very stable. Then you should continue with that daily mindfulness. Once your daily mindfulness stabilizes, you will understand many, many things. The silent daily mindfulness will allow you to see a lot of things that you never see before. Your subtle emotion, mental intention, all those hidden ones, uh, the subtle unconscious and the subconscious, later on you can see them all. And once you can see them, you will understand why your mind creates all those movements, 
why it stir, why it move, why it behave in such a way. Then you can see your views, your opinion, and your conditioning. Then your phobia, your insecurity, your wrong thought. How it conditions your suffering, your misery, all you start to understand. The essential Dhamma, all you see them. That's how mindfulness can be so powerful. When you train your mind, when you develop mindfulness, mindfulness take care of you. If you take care of mind, mind take care of you. It allows you to understand and see all this very clearly. Then the essential Dhamma, like the three evil roots, the five mental hindrance, the spiritual faculty, the dependent origination of Paticca Samopada or dwelling, and the seven factors of enlightenment. All this you will start to see them within your own mind state. Then you start to understand the teaching very clearly, naturally on your own. Okay? But you have a teacher or a good reference book, it will help you a lot. Yeah. But even without them, technically, I always say technically, if you can reach that stage of silent inner awareness, stability or daily mindfulness, technically you don't need a teacher. You will understand the Dhamma on your own. We are the direct C. The silent mind will develop the understanding and the awakening. Maybe without a teacher, without proper guidance, it will take you longer, but you will still succeed. Yeah. As I said, technically, you don't need a teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay, so after that part, you should move on. Yeah. Second step is to make use of this trained mind in silent inner awareness to see things as they are to develop the meditation as taught by the buddha namely the cultivation of the daily mindfulness or sati sampajana the four foundation of mindfulness the three turnings of the four noble truth and the noble eightfold path so all this is a natural consequence because you understand what is meditation to develop the meditation, you need to train your mind to develop heedfulness. The moment you are heedful, you are destined for enlightenment. So to be heedful, there are two factors, two parts towards it. Constantly meditating, ever mindful. So we start with the second one, ever mindful. To be ever mindful, your mind has to develop the initial mindfulness first. So when you are able to develop the mindfulness, then you stabilize it, it will become ever mindful. It's just like mind enters a deep, then only your daily mindfulness can become very stable. If your mind cannot enter a deep in the form of meditation, you don't stand a chance when you are back to society or to your normal uh, daily life or working environment, career, and all those things. Because when you are back to society, to your daily routine, your senses are fully engaged, especially when you walk around, or when you travel, when you are driving, or in the office, when you have to do your work and all the uh, related career activity. You need to fully engage. So your seeing consciousness, your hearing consciousness, your thinking, thought process. And this tree is very active. Of course, smell is required. Taste is required. Tactile also required. But they are not so prominent. So that seeing, hearing, and the thought process, this tree, very very consuming so when your senses are fully engaged and it's like they move so fast so without a 
stable daily mindfulness, you cannot cope with life. You don't know what is going on. You can never be aware. But most of the time, you are lost in thought. Then you see something, memory recall, and you react and you stir. Then the thinking proliferate. You hear something, same. Smell something, same. Then your views, your opinion, your conditioning, or your motive. Everything surface. Make you hideous. So in the midst of life, when your senses are fully engaged, to be mindful is not easy unless you have the stability of mindfulness. This is the reason why I have been emphasizing daily mindfulness. Not until you have developed the stability of daily mindfulness, the real meditation has not begun. So I forget about all that theory. Don't try to know. When you train your mind, just train. Until my enters a deep, then you will understand. Like that day, uh, singing and Brother Jayanta both share differently. Singing develop the training of the mind until the mindfulness can detect the heartbeat on its own. No need a stethoscope, and the heartbeat is very clear. Then I advise her to continue to relax into it and silent until the heartbeat slow down, slow down, the pounding slow down, slow down, until it becomes very quiet, very still, very subtle, until my intensity. Then for Jayanta's case, it's the same. He bow. Now he is able to be aware of what sati is. Then he bow until the body and the mind, the awareness and the bodily movement, they move as one, no talk. Continue to do it. Don't try to know. Until the sati comes. Then after that, the form and mind will understand what sati is. When you suddenly saw it, the body and the mind, awareness, really move as one without thought. And it is so stable. Then when you are able to stabilize that, that every action, every movement, like the awareness can see. Last time you never see it. Last time it's like all disconnected. It, it cannot move like a flow. After the mindfulness stabilized, when you have developed it, the mind has entered the deep. The former mind will know. There is like a flow. Everything is like a flow. Nature's flow. Physical body, the physical flow. Then your mind activity, mental flow. It's like a flow. Flow means what? Continuous. You see it continuous. Yeah. Specific phenomenal awareness. Continuous. Without a stable sati, mindfulness, you cannot have this ability. And without this stability of mindfulness, you cannot meditate. You cannot understand the true Dhamma. That the true Dhamma is to be awakened to. Through the direct seeing. Through the silent mind. Not through the thought process. Yeah not the thought labeling it. Yeah. When you use thought-based meditation, you end up labeling nothing. Thought is active. That's why that is not sati. That one cannot understand. That one is within the field of thought. The instrument itself limits you. That's why you cannot see beyond thought. You cannot understand the Dhamma which is beyond thought, beyond mind. So that is the reason why you need a very stable daily mindfulness. So after you have stabilized that mindfulness, you can become ever mindful. Then you start your real meditation, constantly meditating. As I say, step two is to make use of this trained mind in silent awareness. To see things as they are means to insight into the three universal characteristics of Nichang, Dukang, and Anatta. So, seeing things as they are without your thought, without your memory, your conditioning, your views, and your opinion is very important. To see things as they are, the truth, the reality, without words, without concept without any sankara activity. Okay. If you can do that, 
then you will develop a lot of understanding of who you are, what you are, and how you function as a human being. How your mind operates following the dwelling, that is just some of them, and all the essential Dhamma, you start to see them. So this aspect is very important and can help you to develop the wisdom to awaken. That's why daily mindfulness, the stability of it is very important before you can be in this state. Don't try to know anything. Your that knowing is by the thought, knowledge base, thought base, not the real Dhamma, not the real understanding. So don't try to know, silence, just do until sati come. Then that silent mind that is in the meditative state, fully aware, ever mindful, will understand. It will see things as they are. It will understand. It will awaken. Uh, then Dhamma will arise. Uh, the initial wisdom will arise. Uh, then when you are able to insight into phenomena, the threatening wisdom, Bhavana Mayapanya, they will arise. So all this is what meditation is all about. Then after you have developed that, after you have seen all those things, you can move the daily mindfulness to cultivate the four foundations of mindfulness. Then you can at the same time cultivate noble eightfold path. And when you cultivate noble eightfold path, it will actually lead you back to the cultivation of right view. Right view is very important. Three type of spiritual law. Right view regards to law of karma, law of mind. Law of mind is Paticca Samupada dwelling. Law of karma is Kama Niyama. And finally, the law of truth or Dhamma Niyama. Yeah. Dhamma Niyama will cover the form of the truth. So the form of the truth with its three turning is also very important. The three type of corresponding wisdom, they come along. The first turning gives rise to Sutta Mayapanya, wisdom born of hearing the Sutta. Then second turning corresponds to Chitta Maya, Chinta Maya Panya, wisdom born of reflection, contemplation, and inquiry. And finally, it's Bhavana Maya Panya, the third turning wisdom. So, wisdom born of Bhavana. Bhavana is the meditative discipline. So, this one is the silent mind, meditating. So the third turning wisdom, Bhavana Maya Panya, is very, very penetrated. Whereas the first and second turning wisdom may not be so penetrated as the third turning. But first and second turning wisdom is enough for those who have the parami from the past, who cultivated before. Just like through hearing, they can awaken. Then sometimes through reflection, contemplation, inquiry, they can also awaken. There, these are people with the roots strongly built. They are past parami and cultivation, like winning. Then during the time of the Buddha, a lot of his disciples they have this ability, like Kandanya. The first sermon, Dhammacakapavatana Sutta. When he was proclaimed by the Buddha before he finished, Kondanya became a Sotapan. Then, when he continued with the Anatta Lakana Sutta, all the five ascetics that followed him last time became Arahant. They were not meditating, they were listening attentively to him. That's why first and second turning wisdom can awaken you if you have the past cultivation of Parami. Then we move on. Eh? Point number three. The aim of meditation is to realize the state of enlightenment that is beyond thought and beyond time. Means beyond psychological time. Psychological time is the moment you start to think that is psychological time. Okay? If you don't think, you are in the timeless. 
So this is very important. As I said, is about the timeless, without thought, before the thinking, before the perception, before the knowing. It's just the way. Like the Buddha said, in the seeing, it's only that seeing consciousness that arises. No one to see it yet. No perception, nothing. Just like you can see things as they are. So this is a very important understanding. I read to you again. Eh? The aim of meditation is to realize the state of enlightenment that is beyond thought and beyond time. Here, time means psychological time. Because the Dhamma is timeless or a calico in Pali. So in the salutation to the Dhamma, we always chant. Eh? Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo. Uh, well expounded is the Dhamma by the Buddha. Then what is this Dhamma? The Buddha recite his characteristics. He said this Dhamma is Sanditiko. Can be realized in the here and the now before you die. Then okay. this Dhamma is Akaliko. Means timeless, beyond thought, beyond time. Okay. Then this Dhamma is Ehi Paseko, can be investigated on, is stand up to investigation, where is the truth. Yeah. Then this Dhamma is Pache Tang, oh sorry, uh, Sanditiko, Akaliko, Ehi Paseko, Opanaiko, sorry, leading inward into the heart, Opanaiko. Yeah. Then the last characteristic is Pachetang, Vedita-mo, Vinohiti. Pachetang means can be realized by the wise, each for themselves. Nobody else can. That's why it's an individual thing. The form and mind that realizes it will understand. And can only be realized by the wise, each for themselves. Means the form and mind that awaken to it will understand. That is the meaning. Hmm. Okay, then we move on. Diligently cultivate the five spiritual faculty of Sada, Virya, Siti, Samadhi, and Panya to overcome the five mental hindrance. Uh, or in Pali, it's called Pancha Nivaranas. Hmm? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number four, eh? I miss out. Sorry, eh? we go back one, uh, one point before that. Eh? Number four, thought-based meditation is limited to the field of thought. Hence, it cannot free our mind or lead it to realize the state which is beyond thought, beyond time. Because the moment of thought is psychological time. The moment you start thinking, you are lost in thought, you are no longer aware. Uh, as you are preoccupied in what you are thinking, then the emotion, the reaction, that stirring of mind, everything, they will distract you. That's how you get yourself heedlessly lost in thought. Uh, then most human beings who don't have the training or ability to be mindful, they are easily distracted. They think a lot. Thought proliferation. Yeah. That's the reason why when I was in lower six, I remember my form teacher, also Mrs. Steele, she is very good. She asked us to write an essay, which is a very beautiful essay. It's about how we look at life. Yeah understanding life and all those things. Then I started off by writing the essay in this way. That's why she was so astonished when she read my essay. She just put there rather deeply thought up. <laughs> no more comment. <laughs> I started by saying living beings and human beings especially is a creature of thought. You understand that creature of thought? Well, they think a lot. Or well, at that time, I already knew they think a lot. Yeah. Then 
Pure being is also a gregarious being. Huh? The meaning of gregarious, you know, you need companion. Huh? You need to have friends and all those things. Huh? You need to move around in group and all those things. Huh? It's very difficult for human being to be alone. <laughs> so there is a big difference between aloneness and loneliness. You must understand this. A cultivator can be alone, but he is not lonely. Yeah. But most human beings are lonely. Yeah. That's why loneliness yeah. lead to boringness, <laughs> especially under MCO. <laughs> they develop a lot of loneliness. Yeah. Then they are so boring at home. Yeah. So the monkey mind or the, the, the healer's mind always try to escape from that confinement <laughs> then the thought recall oh yeah last time how nice uh, when there is no mco no control i can do what i like i can call friends i can have yum cha <laughs> uh, or supper <laughs> or we can go travel uh, now everything is so restricted uh, so if you are not trained you will have such problem uh, so that is thought-based meditation. Yeah? Mm. When you understand that you will free your mind, you will train your mind to be mindful, ever mindful, heedful, then use it to meditate. You will not be gullible and foolish. You will not do thought-based meditation. You will not follow what people tell you, focus, concentrate, note this, note that. Verbalize and all those things, no more. Yeah. Then number five, I think we have gone through. Eh? So, diligently cultivate the five spiritual faculty of Sada, Virya, Sati, Samadhi, and Panya to help you overcome the five mental hindrance of sensual desire, ill will, slum and torpor, or sleepiness and lethargic mind, restlessness of mind and doubt. So these five, if you develop the understanding, you can understand how the spiritual faculty will root out the mental hindrance. Yes, they are the direct opposite. Yeah. When you don't have the spiritual faculty, you will become heedless because the five mental hindrance that hinders your mind from entering the meditative state, they will arise automatically. No need to train them <laughs> because you lack the spiritual faculty, and this one will erupt. Uh, they will come up and surface, uh, sometimes in the form of anasaya or asava, uh, the latent tendency. Uh. Then we move on to number six. Eh? Importance of using mindfulness to observe, and uh, oh, sorry. There's number six up there, sorry, I was reading number seven. The danger of having self-delusion and not comprehending what psychiatry or self-delusion is. This is very important. If you cannot see the danger of having the egoic mind that condition your self-delusion, that make you ego, you cannot see that the danger of having that type of mind state, then you cannot awaken. Because this psychiatry is very powerful. So see the danger of having self-delusion, like I used to explain to you all. What is self-delusion? Psychiatry means you deludedly perceive yourself, the form and mind, the human being. In this life, we are born as a human, as a permanent, unchanging entity that you can call me, I, self. If you do that, you will have big problem. But that is delusion. Why? Because the moment you believe you are real, you exist, then you have a problem. Because the egoic mind, the ego, will arise. 
the ego which recognizes this human being as the me and the I is a personality. That's why you are given a name. Then they identify you through your physical body, your race, your Chinese, your religious belief, your views, your opinion, your belief system, religious label. So you are identified and that personality take effect, become conditioned since birth. That's why they are uh, the moment the, the baby is born, they are given a name, register, birth certificate. Then after that, the parent will call you by that name. Then as you grow up, before you go to school, you again yeah, will be identified through your report card, registration, your name card or whatever. Then later on, when you reach certain age, they will give you an identity card. Then when you reach the mature age to travel, they will give you a passport for international identity. So all this is the self-delusion conditioned into you very deeply. Then when you believe you exist, what happened? The personality will make you egoic. So when you are egoic, you try to own things, you try to possess things, you try to have things. That is what greed is all about, the evil root of greed, selfishness. That's why it will condition the evil roots of greed, selfishness, possessiveness, craving, desire. Uh, then when things don't go your way, you react to it, you become angry, unhappy, jealousy. So all this is the evil root of ill will. So the two evil roots of greed and hatred straight away they manifest emotional negativity. Then you have this what they call covetousness, selfishness, craving, desire, lust. Yeah. Then the third one is your fear, your phobia, your worry, your anxiety, your sorrow, your love. And that one is delusion. That's why the three words of greed, hatred and delusion they will overwhelm you. They are so powerful because you fail to see the danger of having this thought, the egoic mind, sakayadity. So the moment the self exists, there is no love, no compassion. There is only selfishness, emotional negativity, and delusion, creating all the fear, worry, anxiety, sorrow, and lamentation. Yeah. Uh, so all this is what the Dhamma is. The three evil roots are the roots of all evil. When you have Sakayadity, the three evil roots follow you. Because there is a being that has this personality that wants to own things, have things, control things. Then you try to have authority. You try to own possess. That's why possessiveness, everything arises. Then you try to develop the authority to control, to have power over other people. Yeah. And it will lead to a lot of evil activity, evil action, evil speech, then evil thought process leading to war, conflict, argument, misunderstanding. So all this is the result of the evil roots. Roots of all evil make you evil. And all this will lead to karmic negativity, cause your karmic downfall. That's how you fail as a human being. When your karmic is not taken care of, when you neglect the law of karma, you will suffer. Because you will act, speak, and think with a heedless mind that has the evil roots of greed, hatred, and delusion. Then suffering will follow you, uh, as per Dhammapada verse 1. Uh, so train your mind to be heedful, so that you will act, speak, and think with a wholesome mind, with a pure mind, free of the evil roots of greed, hatred, and delusion. Then happiness will follow you, like your shadow that never leaves you. 
So this is the Mahapana verse 2. So to live life is very simple. Eh? Choose wisely, choose to be happy. Choose to avoid the Mahapana verse 1. Avoid being heedless. Choose to be heedful, train yourself, develop the stability of mindfulness leading to heedfulness. Then your life change. That's why to improve your life, to change your life is very easy. Character-wise, personality-wise, understanding-wise, you will transform. The moment you are hateful, you will develop the wisdom and the understanding. And you will understand life. You will know how to live life. And you will have the beautiful life. You will know how to take care of your karma. You will understand clearly who are you, what are you. What is this mind all about? All the essential Dhamma of the Buddha will be understood. Then when you understand the fundamental truth, it's like you understand the secret of life. Then you know how to live life. And then you will be able to awaken, and to realize the enlightenment, so that you can live the noble life of enlightenment. The third phase of Dhamma, Pativeda. Mm. Okay, we will move on. Eh? So we are at number seven. Eh? Mm. Importance of using mindfulness to observe and understand how your mind stir or get conditioned into mental thinking or activity, leading to all the emotions and the reaction to sense experience that condition one's suffering as a trap. We are comprehending the famous Mahayana saying of Qi Sing Tong Nian. Uh, this one is very beautiful. The meaning is, the moment you arise, the mundane mind, yeah, you create thinking. And because you create thinking, you stir your mind. Hence, stirring of mind comes to be. Or in the Theravada term, it is called Avijja Pajya Sankara. The first tooling of the dwelling of Patija Samampada. So, Avijja is ignorant. So, dependent on ignorant, mental activity arise. So, ignorant condition, wrong thought, or mental activity, or Sankara. The first tooling of Patija Samampada. So, this one is very important. That's why without mindfulness, you cannot understand. You cannot meditate, you cannot awaken. So it's very important to train your mind to develop the stability of mindfulness so that you can see things as they are, observe the truth and the reality, and understand how your mind stirs and get conditioned into mental thinking and mental activity leading to all the emotion and reaction to sense experience your like and dislike, your pleasant and unpleasant sense experience. Mm. That leads to suffering, mm. how you suffer. So when you see all this, you can straighten your view, then you know how to reverse it, retrospectively reverse it. Without wrong view, you are beautiful. Without the severity, you are beautiful. There is no one to be angry. There is no one to be selfish, greedy. There is no one to fear, worry. That's why without the ego, without the personality, the atta, the egoic mind, the personality, you are so beautiful. You are just the way you are. Because you are not a permanent unchanging entity. That form of mind is never you. That form of mind is dependent, originating, condition arising, cause of phenomena. See it in the meditation, understand it. Then follow the Buddha's essential Dhamma, the five daily contemplation, explained to you very clearly. The physical body, the first aspect of form is not you. Because this one goes the way of nature, no knowing, make up of the four elements. How can it be you? That's why it's of the nature to grow old, get sick and die. For he has not gone beyond old age, 
sickness and death. So if you have this understanding, you will not deludedly cling to this physical body. If you cling, you attach, believing that is you, what will happen? You will worry about it getting old, getting sick and dying. That fear, that worry, that anxiety, that sorrow, that lamentation, that the suffering. That's how you cannot, that's the reason why you cannot attach, you cannot cling. So this aspect is very important. That all external form is the same, like how I teach you in the earlier chapter. Learn how to see form, the unreality of form. Then only you can see beyond form. How do you see the unreality of form? Form is dependent, originating, condition arising. See it clearly, externally, at the physical level. See. Then at the mental level, how do you know that form? Through your perception. And what is perception? It's just a mental image, even more unreal. Externally already condition arising, dependent originating, impermanent, not so real. Then how do you know that form, like the blocker? Just a mental image, even more unreal. Then why do you cling on to it? Hold on to it. Attach and give meaning. And get yourself entangled. All form is a prelude to suffering when you attach and cling. So see it. Understand it. Reflect, contemplate, awaken to it. When you move, unless you can see beyond form, you can never see mind because mind is even more subtle, less tangible. External form is more solid, more tangible. That's why in a similar way to seeing form, you have to see mind. The unreality of this mind is dependent originating, condition arising, phenomena. Then mind is impermanent. That's why it's dependent originating, condition arising, dependent on condition it arise. Then condition ceases to be, it ceases to be. Then you will see clearly, feeling is also like that. Feeling come and go, you didn't die. Perception come and go, you didn't die. And they are all condition arising. You need condition for it to arise. How does feeling arise? You need a sense basis, isn't it? Then you need contact of mind and the sense data. Then only feeling arise. Perception also need mind aggregate. Isn't it? You need the organ as a condition, like seeing consciousness. How you perceive what you see, color, shape, and form, the external form. You need an eye that is in proper condition, function. Then you need a mind to establish contact. Then you need the aggregate of perception to perceive it through memory. Then it enters the mind. See it in the meditation. What I explained to you is theory. But when you see it, you understand very clearly. You don't need to remember anything. So when you understand feeling, perception, mental activity or sankara, mental states, mental intention and all those, whatever that your mind can do is sankara, then you will understand that they are all dependent originating condition arising, cause of phenomena, impermanent. Therefore, you want things your way, you attach and you cling, you suffer. Because it is not nature's way. Then the last one is the mind can be conscious of things. This moment seeing consciousness, next moment hearing, smell, taste, tactile, thought process. So all these are the various types of consciousness that arise and pass away. Dependent originating condition arising. See them in the meditation with a stable mindfulness when you have the ability to be ever mindful. You can see all this very clearly. That's how you awaken and understand. Then you will see mind. Its movement, its activity, its paticca samopada movement. Then how you come to know the world. How you function as a human being. 
you need your senses, you need your mental aggregates to feel, to perceive, to arise emotion, feeling, mental state, thought process, thinking, and all those things. And you need to be conscious of what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you tactile feel and think. So all this will lead you to see clearly the unreality of mind because it is dependent originating, it's impermanent. Then when you understand this, you can use your mindfulness and awareness to see beyond mind. So if I see beyond the physical and I see beyond the mental, then what do I see? I see that true mind, that true nature, which is without word, without concept. I see things as they are. That all of humanity is one. We are no different anymore. When you identify with form, you divide and create a lot of division. When you identify with the thought process, it's the same. Your views, your opinion, your conditioning, your belief system, they are still very different. That's why there is conflict in the world. There is war, there is chaos, there is misunderstanding, argument, and the whole world is full of all this. That is what Monday mind is all about. Duality. Through thought, it divine. Through concept, through idea, it divine. Race, nationality, gender, religion, everything divide the world until there is so much problem, so much conflict and misunderstanding. So when you are able to see all this, then you can understand eh, what that teaching is, the Dhamma that the Buddha has taught. So we finish with number seven. Eh? So number seven, important of using mindfulness eh? after you are trained to observe all this, to understand all this that I have taught you. Eh? To see the unreality, the impermanent, depending on dependent originating, condition arising. See form, the unreality of form, then learn to see beyond form. Then when it comes to my say, then you have a stability of mindfulness where you can see form and you can see beyond form. Then you can see mind. Then you can see the impermanent nature of mind, condition arising nature, dependent originating nature, empty nature. So when you start to see all this using the five analogy that the Buddha has given you for the five mind aggregate, then you become different. Then you can see beyond mind. You know mind is impermanent. You attach and cling, it leads to suffering. And because it's impermanent, it is non-self. It is anatta, empty. Thought come and go, you didn't die. Feeling come and go, you didn't die. Perception come and go, you didn't die. So how can feeling be you? How can thought be you? How can perception be you? How can consciousness be you? If they are not you, then why did they arise in you? Then who are you? What are you? Inquire, ask yourself, find out in the meditation and awaken to it. I have shared all this in the teaching. You can find them in the Heart Sutra book. And read through them, contemplate, reflection, stabilize the understanding and you will awaken. Okay, then we move on to number eight. Originally, before the stirring, the mandema is already in the meditative state of inner peace, silent and still awareness within. So the stirring of the mind only comes about when you do not have the wisdom and understanding of the fundamental principle of the original mind or the true mind. Then thought, Oh, sorry, then through our own self-delusion or ignorance, we cause our mundane mind to arise. Hence, the stirring, we are our own reaction to sense experiences at every moment of sense of consciousness. Train the mind to have the silent inner awareness and clarity to see all this clearly. Then there is no more delusion, 
Therefore, understanding that if we can just let things be, then there is no more suffering or problem. And with this understanding, tranquility will return by not trying to do anything. As I say, don't try to know, don't try to do anything. We are using the thought to suppress or control it, etc. That's what thought-based meditation is all about. They try to control and suppress their feeling. Uh, they say, anger is me. I don't want to have anger. Uh, I want to do away with anger. So they control their mind. They don't want to have anger. They suppress their emotion, their feeling. They label, they verbalize, they note, they focus, they concentrate, they use energy field to stop the thought from moving. All this is thought-based meditation. You cannot free. So see them clearly. Mm. Then when you come to developing the wisdom, all this will help you. Yeah. So I will continue from where I stop. Huh? Uh, that is, just be patient to maintain the silent mind with clear inner awareness and let everything return to its original state before it's done. So this is very easy. Uh, that's why the fourth support for awareness-based meditation is relax into every mind state that arises. Don't focus, don't concentrate, just relax. Even pity arise, sukang arise, concentration arise. Relax into it. Don't go and continue to focus or concentrate or go into one pointedness or absorption. Don't. Just relax into it. Let the mind be. Don't try to do anything. And that is the third way. Five ways to overcome unwholesome thought. The third way. Just maintain awareness, mindfulness. That's why relax the way. The second support is aware. Maintain the awareness for as long as you can. So the third support is 24 hours if you can maintain that mindfulness. So relax and aware is very important. When you are relaxed and aware, you don't give it any more mental energy, wrong thought. Then there is no more wrong thought. It will not condition Sankara activity. It will not stir the mind where it can be at peace with the reality. When you know originally this mind, before my wrong view, before I stir or react to sense experience, it was peaceful, quiet, away. Then why did the mind become heedless, think a lot, proliferate all the way, heedlessly? Lost in thought. Why? Because of mental hindrance. You lack the spiritual faculty. The mental hindrance make you like that. That's how the evil root arise. Yes, the mental hindrance hinders your mind from entering the meditative state. Because you cannot be in the meditative state, you lack the five spiritual faculty. That's how you become heedless. That's how you think a lot. So see it. Understand it. Then don't do anything. Relax and maintain awareness or mindfulness. Just let it be. That everything will fall back to its original state of stillness, tranquility, tranquility and awareness. That's how you will come to realize your true mind as per the unique code. Just relax, aware. Don't do anything. Don't try to know. Don't go and Focus, concentrate, note. Don't stir the mind. No more thought-based meditation. Otherwise, your thought will be active. Then how can you meditate? That's how you must learn how to relax and maintain awareness. To see this clearly. So when you can do that, then you must witness through that silent mind, the awareness, to see how all your Sankara activities slow down, slow down, until finally, like there is a shift in consciousness. Like you suddenly become very quiet, very still. Like middle of the night, suddenly become very quiet. So your mind is the same. When the mental activity Sankara slow down, it becomes very quiet, very still. 
then you will realize the silent mind, the meditative mind, your true mind, your true nature before the mundane mind arise, before the stir, the movement of thought activity, before perception, before knowing. See it. Then you will understand you have two minds. One is the unconditioned, the other one is the dependent originating condition arising, mundane mind, thinking mind. That one is the worldly mind. To live life, you use that. To meditate, you use the true mind. See it, understand it, then you will know how to meditate. Always remember when there is no delusion or ignorance, then there is no stirring of mind. Hence, having the understanding that only wisdom free your mind. That is, the moment you have wisdom, your mind will not stir, and you are free. So no need to do anything after that, because things are just the way they are, suchness, or tatata, -ta -ta, the isness of things. So this aspect is very important. Eh? This aspect of understanding is very important. Then the other way to explain it is the reason why I say only wisdom free is the same as last time I used to advise Kayamita. I remember the first time was Yun Chan. She always asked me, <laughs> she said, this Yoni so Sikara can learn or not. I say you cannot learn. You have to develop it through an understanding. The moment you understand, the Yonisot Manasikara or initial wisdom is there. But before you understand, it is not there. So Yonisot Manasikara, the initial wisdom is, you have means you have. You don't have means you don't have. You cannot at the moment of sense experience want to cut a feeling. Because without wisdom at the moment of sense experience, you cannot cut because you lack wisdom. But when you have wisdom, you need so monasikara developed through the first and second turning wisdom or the third turning. Then at the moment of sense experience, you don't need to do anything. It will arise and prompt you. It can be at the moment of see, hearing, smell, taste, tactile, or thought consciousness. It's the same. That's why it cannot move. That wisdom will arise and tell you, Sabe Sankara Anichang, Sabe Sankara Dukang, Sabe Dhamma Anatta. Or thing is just the way it is. Suchness. Finish. Then Rupang Anichang, Rupang Anatta. Finish. It cannot stir anymore. It cannot move anymore. It's just the way it is. Because this mind understand through wisdom, that's why it can be at peace. It can be at peace under all circumstances, anywhere, any place, any circumstances. Yes, you have the ability to be at peace with every moment of sense or consciousness. Your mind will not stir or not react anymore. It you understand your mindfulness is there, your awareness is there, your initial wisdom is there. That's why this is the one that free your mind, protect you. Without mindfulness, you cannot develop the wisdom. Without wisdom, your mind cannot free. So they are all related. Yeah? See this, understand this. Okay, then we move on. There's a known. Huh? Tata means tas in Sanskrit and Pali. The Buddhist thing, this refers to what is called reality as it is, yatta buddha. This reality is also referred to as suchness or the thusness of things or tatata in Pali, indicating what is or the isness of things. A Buddha or an Arahan is defined as someone who knows and sees reality as it is, yatta buddha nyana dasana. Kata means gone. Huh? That's why the word tata, gata. Huh? It's the past passive participle of the verbal root gam, 
go travel. Agatha, come, is the past. Passive, particle of verbal meaning come, arrive. That's why sometimes they call it the task come one. Eh? Task in this interpretation, Tathagata means literally either the one who has gone to suchness or the task come one, eh? who has arrived at suchness. 